today. I didn't know if you're going to come in time. Talk in the microphone. I didn't know it was going to come in time, but it did. And I've asked Joe Durham to help me display it for you because he's one of the new up and coming and truly um, important um, members of the Shroud community. So if you'll just, this came from Turin. They told me they couldn't send the shroud, but they have sent me the closest Im imitation of the Shroud of Turin available in this world. And I stored it in a suitable container, Gucci Nobile. <laughs> Thank you. It's a reliquary now. <laughs> okay. Let me begin by saying, because um, it's important, I continue to regard Ian Wilson's 1978 book as my Shroud Bible. I have built a Shroud career upon his research. Without his insights about Edessa, Shroud history would begin with Robert de, Cla uh, Robert de Clary in 1203. Ian is the first to applaud the scholar who makes a good case for some theory, even though it may depart from his own position. I'm counting on this as I speak. I consider that he and I have been partners in the search for the true history of the Shroud. Since we had Espresso together, with Archbishop John A.T. Robinson on an, October, on an October evening in Turin in 1978. I wish my friend Ian Wilson could be here with us today in Ohio. First, let me mention that I've offered the dates in my title in order to, communicate, uh, to accommodate all the significant events in the Shroud's history during the missing years. I will begin with a strong statement and then try to back it up with my talk. If the shroud was not at Besançon, where it is named and claimed to have been, during the famous gap in its record, I'm giving it about 1,200 to 1,400 now, it was somewhere else unnamed, unclaimed, unattested, and undocumented. At least three popular hypotheses may be briefly discussed. The first is that of the Knights Templar. This statement means, my statement means, the Shroud of Jesus are not, uh, the words, the Shroud of Jesus, are not found in all the documents of the trials of the Templars. The hypothesis that they possessed the Shroud during the missing years hinges on their worship of an idol in the form of a head. In 1911, already, before the Shroud was ever a Templar issue, Salomon Reinach noted from the records of the trial that no two members gave the same description of their supposed idol. More recently, other scholars have echoed this, noting that no Templar described it as a cloth image, and some said it was a skull or had three heads. They noted, too, that some, inter some interrogated Templars were menials who were never present at the secret me meetings where the idol was supposedly exposed. Yet they too proffered a description. Today the issue is not a Templar possession of the shroud as much as it is the very existence of an idol. The inquisitors used the same questions in the trial of the Cathars. It seems proven now that 
the inquisitors themselves intruded the idol into the interrogations, and the members of the order described one in hopes of receiving leniency. The second um, hypothesis I want to mention is the Smyrna hypothesis. I can say unequivocally that Geoffrey de Charny did not go on the Smyrna crusade in 1346 to get the shroud. Again, the shroud was not mentioned by any of the supposed owners in the Greek East. In 1902, the evidence was manipulated and modern advocates of the Smyrna hypothesis have not noticed it. It's another paper and it's available on Barry's website. The Saint Chapelle hypothesis. Finally, no shroud was ever inventoried among the relics placed by King Saint Louis IX in his new Saint Chapelle, where the, where the Grand Chasse, or Great Reliquary Chest, housed the crown of thorns and other relics from Constantinople in 1248. There we read two contradictory terms, neither of which is the shroud, du saint a piece of the shroud, and une saint fesse, a holy face. Periodic inventories of saint chapelle relics refer to the latter as the sancta toella in tabula inserta, the holy towel of Jesus' face, in a frame. This had been a term for the Mandilian from Edessa. However, the towel had already been unfolded in Constantinople in 958. From then on, we must agree with Ian Wilson that the legend of the Mandilian face only had to be preserved after its ticker tape parade in Constantinople in 944, and something, something was kept separately in the Pharos relic treasury where Clary saw only the container. While the shroud, the Mandilian unfolded, was later moved to the Blachere in the palace where Clary saw it raised up every Friday and identified it as the Sidwan. Hello. That is the shroud. In the meantime, in Europe, Ordericus Vitalis, 1130, and Gervais of Tilbury, about 1211, already described a full-length shroud long before 1248. Yet the towel in a frame continued to be named in the Saint Chapelle inventories until at least 1575, when we know the actual shroud was already on its way from the Savoys in Chambéry to Torino. So these three scenarios, plausible in their own way, and laid out by sincere scholars, are built on foundations of silence. Historiography, however, proceeds by documents. The hypothesis which identifies the Turin shroud with the cloth said to have been previously used in the Easter liturgy at the Cathedral of St. Stephen at Besançon in 1253 has been scrutinized by scholars, but it has never been refuted. In fact, the Besançon hypothesis has been revived often in the past 20 years by me in 1989 and others named here, the most recent being Alessandro Piana in 2007. So Besançon has recently acquired more supporting evidence. But let's all be re reminded, the shroud remains overall relatively free of historical documentation. Don't we know too well? Even Geoffrey de Charny, owner of the Lyre Chambéry Turin Shroud, about 30, uh, 1349 or 50, to 54, never gave any sign that he ever heard of it. Long after his death, his descendants say vaguely that he acquired the shroud as a reward freely given. This is true enough, though one gets the feeling that something's being held back. The official papers of the foundation of Geoffrey's church at Lyre from 1343 to 1353, mention other relics but no shroud. Still, the shroud at Lyre has been vindicated by Bishop Darcy's memorandum in 1389, the shroud's first firm document 34 years after its arrival in Lyre. The Besançon hypothesis is defined by a series of documents and runs as follows. Othon de la Roche, a Burgundian nobleman, who emerged as a leading figure of the Fourth Crusade, 
was awarded the Thief of Athens and somehow acquired the Shroud of Jesus along with other relics in Constantinople in 1204. First, we must ask, who the heck is Othon de la Roche that he, of all the illustrious French knights of the Fourth Crusade, should acquire the most striking relic in Christendom? So our first task is to get the shroud from Constantinople to Othon in Athens. There's a song there. In 1983, Pasquale Rinaldi discovered in Naples a 13th century copy of a letter asserting that the shroud of Jesus from the relic collections in Constantinople was in Athens. Othon had been the seigneur, or lord of Athens, since late in 1204. The letter is dated August 1st, 1205. Theodore Angelos, brother of Michael, who was the despot of Epirus, a province in Greece, wrote to Pope Innocent III, complaining that the shroud of Jesus had been taken to Athens. Michael was owned as Michael uh, of Epirus, was only one of, the f of a few remaining Greek rulers after the capture of Constantinople by the Fourth Crusade. Is the letter to the Pope authentic? Importantly, in 1205, Pope Innocent III was still threatening to excommunicate the leaders of the Western Crusading forces for looting the Christian city of Constantinople. It was a time when a leading spokesman of the Greeks might yet hope that a Pope's intervention might result in the return of the shroud and other relics into Greek hands. In 1989, I uncovered a second support, however, of the shroud's presence in Athens. In the years immediately after this Latin takeover of Constantinople in 1204, Nicholas, abbot of Casole Monastery in southern Italy, was the personal translator for the newly seated Latin patriarch, Benedict of Santa Susanna. The Latin priests and patriarchs took the place of all the Greek um, uh, clerics. Together they held discussions with Greek clergy, hoping to reconcile disagreements over dogma and papal primacy. These dif differences included the Greek use of leavened bread as against the Latin church's use of unleavened host in the uh, Eucharist. Nicholas' reports were written both in Greek and Latin. His reference to the shroud come in the, comes in the midst of a discussion in 1207 of the communion bread. The Byzantines had asserted that a portion of the original leavened bread used by Jesus, hello, <laughs> had been present in the imperial relic collection, but had been stolen. Here is a crucial passage. When the city was captured by the French knights, they entered as thieves in, even in the treasury of the great palace where the holy objects had been kept. And they found, among other things, the precious wood, the crown of thorns, the sandals of the Savior, the nail, singular, and the burial linens, which we later saw with our own eyes. Among the lost relics of the Passion, which Nicholas now enumerated, were that, that bread and Jesus' burial linens. In this passage, the key words are with our own eyes. The question must be asked as to just where it was that Nicholas actually saw the linens. To answer this, we must add what he says in another context, that in 1206, Benedict and he had traveled to Athens and Thessalonica debating the same questions of church unification and, and, Greek the and uh, with the Greek theologians. It may therefore be in Athens that Nicholas saw the burial linens so emphatically with our own eyes, which is such a peculiar part of the passage just cited. Most significantly, he says he saw them after the rush of pillaging of the precious relics by the Crusaders. For the linguists among us, it is crucial to notice that the Latin pluperfect ubi sancta posita erant, where the holy things had been kept, is where he saw them the place where the holy things had been kept, and the Greek imperfect, entois ta hagia ekinto, in which places the holy objects used to be kept, argue strongly that the linens were no longer in the great palace and that Nicholas did not see them there. Theodore of Epirus and Nicholas of Otranto thus provide mutual supports for the shroud in Athens. How did Othon get the shroud? During the second siege of Constantinople, 
which effectively placed the Crusaders in control of the Byzantine government on 14 April in 1204. One of the uh, Besançon historians, Chamard, said that Othon was among the Burgundians following Henry of Flanders and garrisoned in the Blachern Palace. If so, and since the Shroud of Jesus was in this precinct and accessible, as Robert of Clary attested, then Othan could have gained possession of it in that very day. Official ownership could be earned later. Unfortunately, I could not confirm Chamard's assertion of Othan in Blachern by any document. But Theodore's letter about the Shroud in Athens in 1205 does indicate Othan's possession prior to 1205. By summer of 1204, Othan emerged as a personal representative of the Marquis Boniface of Montferrat, who very nearly became the first Latin Byzantine emperor. However, Baldwin of Flanders was elected, and Boniface was compensated by possession of Thessalonica. This, in effect, made him the overlord of a, of a kingdom comprising most of mainland Greece, for which he paid feudal homage to Baldwin. In November of 1204, he appointed Othan as Lord of Athens. This tower on the Acropolis is a tribute attributed to Othan, and it kind of reflects his energy. In 1205, Baldwin was killed, and his younger brother, Henry, was crowned emperor in August 1206. Othan was personally entrusted with a special mission to the new emperor, bearing the offer of Boniface's daughter Agnes in marriage. It is an attractive possibility that in the joyous generosity of this event, check this out, ceremony in Hagia Sophia, reception in the imperial palace, Henry might have awarded or confirmed the shroud to Othan's protection. The question is not so much whether Othan received it, but only about when and how he received it. In April of 1209, after helping to reduce Greek resistance led by the same Theodore of Epirus in the Peloponnese, Othan arrived as a conqueror at Henry's big council at Ravenica. In May, Henry visited Othan for two days in Athens. He was accompanied by Pons de Chaponnet de Lyon, his fiscal agent, and we may say shuttle di diplomat, who had already accomplished missions in the West to profitably dispose of relics, precious fabrics, and imperial jewels in France. The bonding of the two men continued when Othan escorted Henry on his journey to Euboea. Logic demands that Othan would have shipped the shroud or carried it home to Burgundy, based on Sohn's territory, sometime either in 1208 uh, 1206 or in 1219, uh, he sent it to his Burgundian cast, Chateau de Rye sur Saône near Besançon. Michel Bergeret and Alessandro Piana have provided evidence now that this was the permanent home of Othan Shroud. It is a wooden chest labeled as that in which the shroud folded in 48 layers was brought or sent by Othan in 1206. The great Byzantine scholar Edouard Brion noted that Pons de Lyon was sent to Burgundy in 1219 on an undefined but important mission. Given Pons' other special assignments and the friendly relationship that existed between Emperor Henry and Othon, it is not too brash to suppose, it's my best choice, that in 1219 Pons might have delivered Othon's precious relic to his Chateau de Rye. Othan died between sometime between 1224 and 1234. Though no written document attests to Othan's return home, Piana has described a, rel a replica of a tomb memorial in the chateau, whose epitaph reads, under this stone is buried Othan de Rai. Pray God that the enemy no longer can surprise him. A short historical digression may serve to indicate what major events could become factors in the itinerary of the Shroud in France. From 1309 to 1377, the papacy resided at Avignon. 
French popes pursued a French foreign policy. The third, by, third, by, I'm sorry. by 1377, there must have been few alive who had ever known a papacy that was truly the spiritual leader of all Europe's Christians. After 1377, rival popes in Rome and in Avignon claimed the allegiances of Catholics in what is called the Great Western Schism. The location of Besançon rendered it a hotbed of all the political and religious dichotomies of the times. Sometime capital of Burgundy, the city straddled France and the German Holy Roman Empire in its geography and politics. A French party constantly worked for the city's annexation by France and for the legitimacy of the French antipopes. A German party strove for Besançon's continued attachment to the empire and, not surprisingly, supported the popes in Rome. The family of Vergy were among the fro pro-French faction in Burgundy. Besançon's historians wrote that on March 6, 1349, a fire in St. Stephen Cathedral resulted in the apparent destruction, or certainly the disappearance, of their shroud and the loss of all church documents attesting to the circumstances of its arrival in the city. Safe in the chateau, however, the shroud survived the fire and was accessible to Jeanne, or I'll call her probably, slip up and call her Jean de Vergy, who lived from about 1320 to 1388, descended from Othon, and with her family's proper claim to ownership. In 1349, Jean could deal, sorry, Thibault, Jean could deal with the shroud in the same way that the Savoys exercised their family's ownership of the shroud well into the 20th century. The powerful Vergy family had a virtual lock on the post of Seneschal in Besançon from 1191 to 1310. Brother Hilary de Cremier, uh, a recent writer, especially has supported my own research in the Winchell Art, uh, Shroud Collection, our archives, with thanks to Father Otterbein, rest in peace, giving virtual certainty that the in the confusion of the moment, Jean carried the shroud out of Burgundy to her marriage to Geoffrey de Charny between 1351 and 1354. All the evidence for the ever silent Geoffrey's acquisition of the shroud leads neatly to his second wife, Jean de Vergy. This is what was not said in the Charny's vague reward freely given. It would have been unwise to announce that Lyre now possessed Besançon's lost precious relic. In 1929, Noguier Malijai suggested a variation on this theme. It enforces it, if anything, namely that Jean de Vergy brought the shroud out of Burgundy, thereby saving it for France. Malijai argued further that she presented it first to the French king, Philip VI de Valois, who died in 1351 who in turn awarded it to Geoffrey de Charny, his trusted porte d'oeflamme, or banner bearer, as a major relic to be placed in the as yet unfinished new church at Lyre, and as a wedding present that was again freely given. In any case, the question of the Shroud of Jesus in Besançon and its transfer to Lyre has a decidedly political dimension. Dorothy Crispino, my old friend, <laughs> Olo, who has vigorously denied the validity of the Besançon thesis, has found a request by Geoffrey I, this Geoffrey de Charny, to Pope Innocent VI on 3rd of August, 1354, for permission to have a cemetery uh, by his uh, new Lyre church. As Dorothy has put it, Geoffrey changed, quote, changed his mind, unquote, about where he wished to be buried, and his new choice was in his new graveyard. She is sure, and I can agree fully, that the reason was his obtaining possession of the shroud about that time. Dorothy's valuable evidence places any acquisition of the shroud uh, by Geoffrey in the 1340s in serious doubt. Furthermore, most of the 1340, in most of the 1340s, Geoffrey was pursuing his career as a fighting knight in Western France and twice was imprisoned. 
This left little opportunity for a wedding, at least in 1340, in the 1340s. Ian Wilson noted that in 1355, Geoffrey gave a receipt as Lord of Savoisy in Montfort for the removal of the Shroud from Leary on account of the dangerous presence of the British in the Hundred Years' War, 1337-1453. These titles and properties were acquired via his marriage to Jean. In 1356, after Geoffrey's death, ownership of the relic was exercised by Jean. It remained safe in their castle of Montfort from 1356 to 1389. Jean's death must have occurred during this period, for Bishop Darcy's Memorandum of, 30, of 1389 named Geoffrey II as displaying the shroud in Lyre falsely as the true shroud of Jesus. The absence of any mention of the shroud in the earliest documents, 1343 to 53, of the Lyre church and the presence of the Vergy arms on the Seine, Seine medallion point uh, to Vergy to Vergy's ownership and Jean's delivery of the shroud from Besançon. No other theory of the missing 150 years has ever explained so efficiently or at all how Geoffrey wound up with the shroud. In 1624, Chiflet, Besançon's first historian, convinced that the original shroud was consumed in the St. Stephen fire, wrote that in 1377, it was miraculously discovered in a niche in the new cathedral. In 1902, based on the illustrations of the Lyre and Besançon shrouds from Chiflet's book, Paul Vignon wrote that the shroud of Besançon was clearly a replica of that of Lyre, made between 13, uh, the years 1349, the fire, and 1375. Besançon's own historian, Don Francois Chamard, also in, in 1902 agreed, though he was not forthcoming about how Lyre had obtained the original. Remember how Bishop Darcy complained in 1389 that in Lyre an artist had painted an image shroud? Now we can demonstrate that there really was a copy of the shroud painted by an artist. It was most likely commissioned by Jean, now Lady of Lyre, the Lady of Lyre, and sent to in 1377 as a replacement for the one she had taken out of Besançon in 1349. Opposition to Besançon is largely the result of <clears throat> the loss of records. What shall we make of the fact that local scholar Chiflet in 1624 knew nothing of Othan? It's time to play the lost documents card. I hate to do it, <laughs> but we, we must and, and, and we can do it and it will make sense. Recall the loss of virtually all church records in the from the fire in 1349. This means that in Chiflet's time, there were no documents attesting to the role of Othan in the Shroud's arrival in Burgundy. Then comes a strongly anti-clerical French revolution. Gautier, authoritative archivist of Besançon, who was not, by the way, a defender of the, of the towns ever possessing the, the true shroud of Jesus, wrote, quote, he wrote this in, 13, in 1901, and when the delegates of the departmental directory of Dubes threw to the fire or shredded all the administrative records of the diocese over four centuries, this destruction reduced by about nine-tenths the sources of the archbishopric. Now, altogether, they form only 534 articles and date from 1412 to 1790. This destruction of all ecclesiastical records before 1412 immediately announces the obstacles in the path of Chiflet as he attempted to reconstruct the history of the shroud in his city. Jean's role in removing the shroud in 1350 is also lost. In fact, the frontal only replacement shroud of 1377 was singled out in the official account of those events in 1794 as having been torn into bandages. My next point is supremely important. It needs to be understood that writers who casually reject the Besançon hypothesis have focused only on this replacement, the copy of 1377 with its frontal only image. It was the Lyrae painted copy. 
Those detractors have wasted many pages proving what nobody denies, that the later shroud in Besançon was not the shroud of Turin. Look at the picture. <laughs> Uh, in short, these refutations have not disproved the original shroud sent to Burgundy from Athens. The present fresh approach to the Besançon hypothesis provides answers to some major issues in shroud history. Besançon's possession of the replacement shroud solves the issue of why the city did not more strenuously claim prior ownership of the Lyrae shroud. They had the copy, and they believed it to be the rediscovered original. In 1624, Pour Chiflet, well aware of Lyrae's shroud, opined that there had been two real shrouds, one for carrying the body and one for wrapping it. A frequently used argument against Besançon's one-time possession of the present Shroud of Turin is that the earliest extant record of it in the city dates from 1523. However, to be accurate, this was a reference to the city's Easter ritual. Nobody says Besançon first received a shroud in 1523. Chiflet thought that the ritual already was used in Besançon before the union of St. John and St. Stephen in 1223 and that it was renewed in 1523, renewed in 1523. In the Eastern uh, liturgy, in um, most of the Greek Orthodox churches, and in fact in Besançon's as well, uh, three deacons carried out an epitaphios cloth uh, which in some cases, or in one case, might have been the shroud itself, as in Besançon. A few other thoughts before I close. The question has never been asked as to why, given the shroud's adverse notoriety in Lyrae in the 14th century and its possession in 1523 by the powerful Savoy family in Chambéry, Besançon should seriously enter the shroud business in that year. Besançon's claim on the shroud of Jesus makes sense only if the city had possession of the original. Chifle did not mention Othan, but he was clear when he wrote, quote, the fire burned up the shroud and the details of the shroud's arrival. That is the means, the time, and the carrier, end of quote. The next episode seems to be a patent and deliberate conspiratorial contrivance. However, instead of destroying the Besançon thesis, it rather strengthens it. Chiflet wrote that in 1377, the cloth in its chest was rediscovered by means of a strange light coming from a hidden part of the cathedral. Judging from the lapse of time of 28 years, 1349 to 1377, between the fire and the rediscovery, there could not have been many in Besançon who, who knew precisely what the original had looked like. Here comes my exciting conclusion. Archbishop Guillaume de Vergy, notice the last name, 1371 to 91, was the fifth in line since the fire. That is to say, four archbishops who might have been able to compare the replacement cloth with the original had died. In order to determine if it was the same true burial shroud of Christ previously lost, Chiflet relates that the cloth newly found in 1377 was placed upon a corpse which revived and which miraculously sat up and began giving shroud lectures. <laughs> it was a Vergy, therefore, who verified by a miracle that the new Besançon replacement shroud was indeed the original Besançon sh shroud. Is anyone thinking family cover-up? <laughs> Nobody doubts that the new cloth residing in Besançon until the destruction, its, this, its destruction, in 1794, was only the painted copy. There supervenes the history of the shroud at Lyrae, the shroud whose continuity extends to the present day, the shroud which is beyond doubt identifiable as the Shroud of Turin. Besançon's claim to possession of the true burial wrapping of Jesus thus gradually evaporated. You may judge if the case for the shroud in Besançon during the lost years remains merely an hypothesis. It offers documents that name the shroud, which other hypotheses do not. It has a reasonable provenance from Constantinople via Othon. It affords us the moment and circumstance for Geoffrey de Charny's acquisition of the cloth, which no other hypothesis could do. All this makes Besançon the hypothesis 
most likely to hold the truth about the missing 150 years. Thank you. Don't go too far.